so there are different kinds of long-term debt. There's notes payable, bonds payable, and leases. So those are different ways for us to do capital structuring within our company, meaning where does the company finance itself? Where does it get its money from? Because we usually have to take out chunks of money in order to either expand our operations, improve our operations, uh, you know, do research and development. You know, there's always reasons that the company will be looking for more money to be able to, um, you know, carry on. So these are different ways that it can um, expand into the future. So we're going to talk about a couple of these. All right. So a note payable is is usually taken out by a company from the bank. So in this case, the bank is making them sign a note, which I think is kind of derived from, you can think of like the back of a napkin. I think that's where this whole thing started with the whole note. You know, it's actually a piece of paper that the company signs promising to pay back the amount that they borrow plus the interest, okay? So that is what we call a notes payable. And so the interest on that note, because nobody's gonna lend a company money just for fun, they're always going to require that interest be paid. So how does that interest get calculated? For a simple interest on a note payable, you'll take the face amount, how much was borrowed, times the annual interest rate, times the fraction of the year that the note was taken out if it was, um, taken out you know mid-year and you still have to close your books you're going to figure out what the fraction of the year is for that interest okay and we're going to go through a couple of examples i think that's probably the best way to handle this so assuming southwest airlines borrows a hundred thousand dollars from the bank of america on september 1st they sign a six-month note so when they sign the note they're going to take the hundred thousand dollars why because the bank just gave them a hundred thousand dollars so here comes my cash increasing and i'm also increasing my notes payable by a hundred thousand dollars so remember the note was taken out on september 1st so on the 31st southwest airlines knows that they've incurred some interest even if they're not paying bank of america for that interest at the moment on december 31st but they have accrued some interest expense. So how do we know how much interest expense? Well, we take the amount that we borrowed, the $100,000 times the annual interest rate of 6%, and then we, div we multiply it times four twelfths of the year. Why four twelfths? Well, they took it out on September 1st, so that's September, October, November, and December. That's four out of the 12 months of a year. So you take that 100,000 times 6% times four twelfths, you come up with $2,000 of interest expense. Keeping in mind now, they haven't actually paid that interest, but they've certainly incurred that much interest expense. So they put that into a payable account because they're not gonna pay the bank at the moment. On December 31st, they're gonna do it when they pay back the note. So then on March 1st of the following year, what happens? Now they're going to pay the note back to Bank of America. So they're going to decrease their accounts payable with a $100,000 debit. And then they're going to also take some interest expense for 2019. Remember the interest expense up here? That was for 2018. Now they have interest expense for two months, January and February, because they paid it back on March 1st of two out of the 12 months. So you take 100,000 times 6% times 212, so you get a thousand bucks. So that's the expense um, for interest on in 2019. And then they take the interest that they put into a payable account back in 2018, and they're gonna decrease that because, wait for it, now they're gonna pay Bank of America back. So they're gonna pay them $103,000, which represents the 100,000 that they borrowed, plus $3,000 in interest. So I want you to pay attention to this slide and you may have to revisit this so that you really understand what's going on here. Alrighty, so sometimes if the amount of the payment, like think a mortgage, might have um, installments and the payments remain constant throughout the years and the amount of that payment that goes towards interest expense decreases while the amount of the payments that you make that are applied towards the principal increase 
every year and this is compounded interest so this is a really fun one and this is typically how mortgages work so let's say I take out a loan for $25,000 and the cash these are my monthly mortgage payments and so what I do is I say okay I took out this much how much is my interest expense I take the 25,000 times the interest rate and I come up with $125, $125. So the decrease in the carrying value, meaning how much of my $587.13, which was my monthly payment, how much of that is being applied to interest and how much of that is being applied to the principal. So the 462.13, which is applied towards the principal, gets taken out from the carrying value, 25,000 minus 462.13 is this amount right here. Then the next time they make a payment, in this case, the next month, which is about when mortgages are due is every single month, they pay the same amount. Now the amount that's applied to interest actually goes down, so I'm gonna take this carrying value times the interest rate. I come up with 122.69. That means that more of my $587.13 gets applied towards the principal. Do you see how the 462, this is moving up. Isn't that, that's just the coolest thing. So now the amount, <laughs> the amount of my carrying go, value goes down by how much I was able to apply towards the principal. And so on and so on and so on. And so I just kind of blew this out through the home, the years. And then you can see that finally, more and more of the monthly payment is applied towards the principal until at which time the carrying value goes down to zero, which means you've paid back your loan. So a line of credit is an informal agreement with the bank so that it's similar to like a home equity line of credit if you've ever had that kind of thing. It's an agreement that you can have a certain amount of money that's available to you at any time. It's a pre-arranged limit. You don't have to go through the whole loan procedure in order to get this money. So sometimes we have lines of credit for a pre-arranged amount and it just is less paperwork and still allows us access to cash. And other times if a company borrows from another company, then that's referred to as commercial paper. So it's the same as a notes payable, it's recorded the same way, only this time it's from one company to another as opposed for, to the company borrowing money from the bank, and that's called commercial paper. So how a company finances itself is what we call the capital structure. So how much does a company take on in liabilities versus how much do they take and issue stock to raise money, okay? And so we either have debt financing, so in other words, we take on more liabilities, or we have equity financing, which means we issue more stock. And they each have their pluses and minuses, and those are the basic ways that a company will finance itself. And again, there are pluses and minuses to each of those. So let's talk about bonds. So bonds um, are, are instruments that a company uses, again, to raise money, and these are companies either profit, not-for-profit government, you can think of like Caltrans issues these bonds to be able to fund um, building new roads, you know, fixing roads, building bridges, overpasses, and new intersections, you know, that kind of thing. So this is, um, these bonds are typically used when they, when a company needs to borrow large amounts of money and maybe doesn't want to take all that on in terms of a liability uh, or a loan from the bank. So this way they cast a wider net and they're able to um, raise more money. So um, the the bond is literally, you can kind of envision this like a piece of paper, it's like a certificate, and they're usually in thousand dollar increments, and they can issue as much as they can, and people, um, you know, of all walks of life, depending on how they want to structure their, in their own internal investments, will purchase these. So there's usually a stated amount of interest 
that is paid to a bondholder. So again, you wouldn't loan money to somebody without something coming back to you. So if you were to purchase a bond, say a thousand dollar bond from Caltrans, Caltrans is gonna set it up such that you get interest payments paid to you every six months. And that's cool. And then you'll also get your thousand dollars back at the end of the term, whenever, however long that bond has been issued for. So. Um, there's usually a contracted rate, a stated rate that's on that certificate, and um, so then again, you'll pay, you'll get that money back at the end, in addition to the, all the interest along the way. So it's kind of cool. And if you click on this little thing right here, you'll hear a no snippet from NPR on bonds. It's uh, my favorite guy, Kai Rizdal, and it's a minute and twenty-one seconds long I think and it talks about some of the bonds and on the market so you can listen to that okay so the advantages of a company or a nonprofit agency or a government agency or you know whoever it is the advantages of issuing bonds is that they can raise capital without affecting the company ownership what does that mean well that means that if the company decides to go out to the stock market to raise more money by issuing more stock they're diluting their ownership because you know that every uh, stock that is sold is actually like getting a piece of the um, the ownership of that company okay so if they issue bonds they don't have to do that in addition the interest that a bond issuer like Caltrans um, any of the interest that they pay is tax deductible, okay? And it affects their return on equity, meaning they don't have to issue equity or stocks. And so it just affects the way that their ratios are calculated. And there's a lot of complicating factors, and we can get into that if we take a financial class where we talk about more about the stock market, more about capital structure. You might get into that in your next... Um, intermediate accounting class if you go that far. Now there are some disadvantages to bonds and that is that um, when a company issues a bond that means that they're required to pay interest. As you know if a company issues stock they're not obligated to give you anything. They might give you a dividend but there is no guarantee that when you purchase that stock it's actually going to be worth anything tomorrow. So your risk is a little bit higher, your reward is higher because you might make more money than you would with a bond um, and that's why sometimes a company will favor stock instead of bonds. So again, you know, I was telling you there's advantages and disadvantages to both. So the disadvantage of the bond is that they actually have to pay interest on it. Okay, so that can be bad for their cash flow. Now, this slide just shows you some of the mechanics about how bonds are actually bought and sold because you, go, you don't go directly to like Caltrans and buy a bond. They're actually uh, negotiated on a secondary market similar to how stocks are. So you have the American Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. Um, after they're issued, they're often, they're frequently bought and sold by different investors. And they could be, it could be that the market rate is different than the stated rate that gets put on the bonds which we're going to talk about in a minute so we um anyway so there will be different cash flows available but um they're not directly issued by the company to the individual consumer they're just um they're put out on the secondary market and there are different kinds of bonds so there's secured bonds that are backed by collateral meaning wow if i give a thousand dollars to Caltrans or Starbucks or McDonald's or who's ever issuing the bond, what assurance do I have that the company isn't going to go under and never pay me back? So some, are, some bonds are backed by some sort of collateral, similar to when you take out a car loan. Well, the car itself is the collateral, so if you don't pay back your car loan, they'll just take your car. So that's what we mean by collateral. Some bonds are unsecured, meaning they're not backed by any collateral. And the term is simply how long the bond is issued for. And then um, serial bonds means that they mature in at different phases. Callable bonds means that the person who issues the bond may take it out for 10 years, but maybe in five years they're done with their project. So they may call those bonds back. They may then repay 
the bar the person who bought the bond they may just pay him back and say I'm good thank you very much and that can be a callable bond that's called before the actual maturity date of that bond and another one is a convertible bond so they may take that bond and say okay I'm going to change this out to anybody that's holding on to my bond and I'm going to give them stock instead so the general characteristics of a bond is um, that it has an issue date and then it so we know when it matures which is the maturity date so it's issued on a certain date matures on a certain date and has a certain rate of interest that never changes so we're going to get into what happens if the rate that's printed out on that pretty certificate what if that rate is not reflective of the current market rate right so what do we do all right and i'm going to explain that to you next so what happens in this case is let's say the stated interest rate is 5% on the bond. So the bonds were issued, they printed out all these beautiful pieces of paper. This is not really how it works, but I think this is a good example. So they print out all these piece, pieces of paper at $1,000 increments. Let's say the stated rate on those is 5%. Well, then they hold on to those bonds for a while and they try to issue those. And by the time they get around to that, then the market has gone up to 6%. So who would want to buy my bond that's issued, at, you know, that's going to pay 5% when the market is paying 6%. So what have I got to do? Well, now I have to kind of put my bond on sale because my stated amount is below the market rate. So I got to put that as a discount. When it's the same, if my stated rate is 5% and the market's paying about 5%, then it's going to be issued at par. But, um, if the um, amount of my stated bond is 5% and the market's only paying 3%, what would you rather do? Would you rather earn 5% or 3%? Well, for me, I'd rather earn 5%. So I'm going to have to pay a premium to get those bonds so that I can earn that 5% instead of the 3% that's being paid everywhere else. And here's just another example of when a bond sells at a premium because um, it's it, the rate that's on the certificate for the bond is above what the market's paying. If it's equal, it's at par. If it's below, it's at a discount. So you can figure out what the issue price of a bond is if you have a financial calculator. So I've given you the factors here. Um, I personally like to use Excel, and so I have created a spreadsheet just for you, and I'm going to allow you to try to put in a present value in this spreadsheet. So I've actually opened the spreadsheet. You cannot be in presentation mode when you open this spreadsheet and you can see that it looks similar to this. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill this out. So the par value, meaning or the face value of my bond is $100,000. So I'm gonna type in $100,000. The interest payments are simply what's the face amount of the bond times what's the interest rate in this case it's a seven percent round you see the bond stated rate is seven percent and then how often do i pay that i pay that semi-annually so i'm going to divide that by two and that's how i get my interest payment all right what's the market interest rate well if the market is also paying seven percent i need to actually divide that by two so i'm going to point zero seven that divided by two and then how many periods is this bond? So in this case, it is a 10-year bond. I'm gonna put that up here for you guys. So it's a 10-year bond. And so the number of periods, meaning how many, if it's a 10-year bond and I'm being paid twice a year or semi-annually, that means I'm gonna have 20 periods. So here's where the fun comes in. So what's the issue price of this bond? Now, because the bond stated rate is 7% and the market rate is also 7%, this bond is going to be issued at par. That's what we call it. But how do we actually, con uh, how do we actually confirm that? So I'm going to go up to this FX. This is going to come up and I'm going to use the PV function. Now I use the PV function a lot, so it's actually on my recently used. If yours isn't appearing there, no problem. Just type in PV, do go, and here you're going to have the present value. So then you come over here and you go, what's the rate? So here I'm just going to click on this cell for rate. 
how many periods there's how many periods what are my payments every six months I've already calculated that and what's the future value and that would be a hundred thousand dollars so what I'm finding out here is what does what is this bond going to be issued at considering the fact that the market interest rate is seven percent I'm going to be paid 20 periods $3,500 so how much and then I'm going to be paid back by $100,000 at the end so what's that bond going to be issued at and how do you like that now I have to put a minus sign in between because it always comes out as a negative number and I can't explain that so all right so uh, this totally makes sense doesn't it I'm going to have a $100,000 bond that I'm going to issue out every six months I'm going to pay $3,500 to whoever buys my bond and that means, and then at the end of the bond period, which is at the end of 10 years, I'm going to give them $100,000 back. All right, it's a good deal for me because I get to borrow the money. It's a good deal for the person who buys my bond because they get um, interest payments for the $3,500. Okay, and then, so if the market is paying 7% and my bond is paying 7%, they're going to pay $100,000 for that. Well, what happens if and I'm going to put the same amount in so the interest get this so it's still a hundred thousand dollars in bonds the interest payments notice really carefully this does not change the interest payments stay the same but in this case the market interest rate changes so here I've told you that the market is actually at 10 percent remember my bonds are only paying seven percent Hmm. So what's going to happen? So what's the market interest rate? It's 0 0.10, and I oops, I have to get closer. 0 0.10, and then I'm going to divide that by two. Why am I dividing that by two? Because I pay it every six months. How many periods? Again, it's still 20 periods. But now, what's the issue price? So here again, I'm going to use my PV function, and I'm going to put in the rate, which in this case is the 0.50. How many periods? 20 periods. What are my payments? They're still 3500 How much is going to be due at the end? Still that $100,000 if I click OK. Oh, look what happens. Now, actually, I have to issue that bond, that $100,000 in bonds, for $81,306.68, meaning that I have to put that bond on sale. You may want to look at this and kind of listen to this again and again because I know I go kind of fast because I'm used to Excel, but I think after you watch this a couple times, you'll get it. Okay, so here, again, my interest payments are the same. Now the market is paying 5%. So what's my new rate? It's going to be 0.25 because, again, I'm paying it every six months. The number of periods is still 20. Again, I'm going to use my present value function. And now the rate is 0.25. Everything else stays the same. My payments are still $3,500. I still have to pay back $100,000 at the end. And now you can see that I'm actually going to get $115,589.16. And that's how much I'm going to collect from the people that are going to invest in my bond. They're going to get $3,500 every year for the next 10 years semi-annually and then at the end I'm going to pay them back $100,000 but because the market's only paying 5% but my bonds are paying 7% they have to pay a premium to get that bond so anyway I hope that helps you now you can find that exact same information by looking at the present value tables which are at the back of your book so you can find this factor. You can search the textbook for either the present value of a dollar or the present value table, and it's the second one. And then that will give you this figure. If you look at the, the periods that say 20, and then you roll across to the interest rate that's being paid, which is the 7%, and you'll find that factor there. And then this is the annuity factor. So that deals with your interest payments and you'll wind up with the same numbers. I personally like Excel the best. So what are the journal entries that we make? So 
When we issue a bond, we're going to take in the cash from the investor and we're going to enter a liability called bonds payable. Every six months when we pay the interest, then we're going to make an entry for bond interest expense of whatever the expense is. In this case, it was a million dollar bond. Um, and so, and it was paying 10% for six months, so there's my bond interest expense, and there's the cash that comes out. This is the journal entry that gets made when my bond is issued at par. Now, if my bond is issued at a discount, so for this million dollar bond, if the stated interest rate is 10%, but the market's paying 12, that means that I will actually not get the full million dollars at the beginning, I'll have to take a hit on that. I'll have to take a slight discount on that. Okay, so again, you can go in and try to figure out what the issue price is using that same exact Excel spreadsheet that I set up with you, which is kind of fun. Okay, but you'll find, or you can use the present value tables that you find in the back of your book. And those are your factorings right there. And you can see that as a bond issuer, I'm only going to get $926,405 for that, but at the end, I still have to pay my bondholder back the million dollars and I still have to pay them interest. That's just the name of the game because the stated interest rate on my bond is less, is paying less than the interest rate that's being paid on the market. Okay, and because I'm not getting as much cash as the par value on those, then that's the discount. Okay, so I just took the million dollars less what I'm going to get, and that's the discount. And so when I sell that bond, again, I'm not going to get the full million, right? I still have a liability for a million dollars. I'm only going to get 926405 in cash. The rest of it is the discount and that's how I make that journal entry. Okay, if I amateurize that amount, then every single time when I make an interest payment on that, I'm still gonna pay out $50,000 as a payment um, in cash to my bondholders, but in this case, I actually have a little bit more of an expense. So now I'm going to amortize some of that bond payable based on what the full discount amount is divided by how many periods I have to amortize that. That's how I got this number over here. And then the 57,360 is the total amount of interest expense I've got. Okay, so I've skipped forward a couple of slides. Um, and I'm now going to issue this at a premium. So in this case, my par value is still that million dollars. My stated rate is the 10%, but now the market's only paying 8%. So me as a smart investor goes, woo, look at this bond is paying 10%. I can only make 8% everywhere else. I'm buying this bond. And the bond people that are issuing it go, whoa, 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 not so fast. You're gonna have to pay a little bit more because I'm paying a higher interest rate. So what does that look like? So now, and you can figure this out too if you were to put that in your spreadsheet. So you can put in the million dollars and the stated interest rate, which is 10%, the market's only paying 8%. You put in your interest payments of the 50,000 and you'll come up with the fact that the investor in your bond is gonna have to pay a little over a million dollars to buy that bond. So they're gonna pay 81,145 over that. But the good thing for them is that they're gonna get a better interest rate. So they might be motivated to do that. Okay, so here's how the entry looks when I actually sell a bond at a premium. So here you can see I'm taking in more cash. Here's the premium that I'm gonna amortize over the life of that bond. And then here's my bond payable down over here. So this is a, um, this serves to be kind of like a contra account for us, okay? And here's how I amortize that premium. So in this case, I still pay out the 50,000 every six months, 
And now you can see that I'm amortizing that premium, which serves to reduce my interest expense. Okay, and here's how this would be amortized. So you can see that I've got a million dollars eighty million eighty one thousand one forty five. That's how much I took in. This is the premium. Okay, so every six months I'm paying fifty thousand dollars. My interest expense simply means that it's the premium that's amortized over the period of the loan less the 50000 That's how I get the amount of my interest expense. And then that eventually goes down to a million dollars. So that premium is amortized over the carrying life of that bond. So here's a graphic example of how the premium gets amortized and serves to reduce the interest expense of that bond. And the discount also gets amortized eventually so that it brings itself up to the price of that bond so there's actually an increase in your interest expense should you issue that bond at a mm -hmm. discount and so now that we've issued the bond there's some ways that we can actually retire those bonds and as you remember one of the ways that we can do that is call that bond so we're gonna we could have a callable option and that means that the company just purchases those bonds back pays everybody back everybody goes home happy. So that's another way. And you can also purchase them on the open market. And the last topic that I'm gonna talk about are contingent gains. And remember when we were talking about contingent losses and we recorded or we put in a footnote a contingent loss, meaning that we think we might lose some money, but we're not really sure how much and, and uh, we're not really sure if it's going to happen. Well, in the case of a contingent gain, this means that there's an uncertain situation and it possibly might result in a gain. Okay, so maybe we think we're going to win the lawsuit, but here's the deal, because we're actually conservative accountants, we actually do not record or footnote the gain until it's certain, okay? So we might record the fact that we're gonna have a loss, but we don't record the fact that we might have a gain, okay? So I've given you a couple of analysis as a result of working with liabilities, and then at the very end, I've given you, hold on, wait for it, I've given you a couple of questions that you can answer, okay? And then um, the answer actually comes up with an explanation after you do these. So if you put that in presentation mode, then you won't get the answer until you've actually thought it through yourself and hopefully that helps. Okay, and that's the end of chapter nine.